Hey everyone, this is Mike with Confused IT. In this video, I want to take a, a few minutes to go through a, a quick rundown of how to create a virtual machine in ESXi. Uh, I'm not going to go over some of the more detailed settings when you create a VM, but I'm just going to kind of give a, a visual, quick visual overview of what the uh, screens look like and kind of what the default settings are for making a simple VM. So the first step here is obviously logging into your ESXi host. Um, in this case, I'm running a, a 7.0 host, which I, at the moment, I wouldn't recommend. It's definitely a little buggy um, in the testing that I've done, but the interface is very similar to 6.7 and 6.5, so, um, you know, and I think even 6.0 uh, may have had a similar interface as well for when it had a web UI. So, um, instructions should be the same, uh, or look very similar to older versions, should be pretty pretty straightforward. So I'm going to go to the create slash register VM button up here in the corner. Um, there are a few different options here. Uh, the first one is just to create a brand new VM from scratch, which is what we're going to do in this video. The second one allows you to basically deploy a virtual machine from a template, um, which is an OVF or an OVA file. And the third option is to register an existing VM, meaning that you, you have the files for a VM somewhere but it's not showing up in ESXi, so you need to sort of re-mount or register that virtual machine back into ESXi. So this option will let you browse to those files that you have for the VM and register it back into the interface so that you can kind of boot it up and start using it again. So into the first option here, we'll hit next. We're just going to give it a quick name. In my case, I'm going to make a test machine. Uh, the compatibility level, this is basically important if you are planning on moving this VM somewhere onto a ESXi host that has an older version of ESXi than you're currently running. Um, VMs are typically, sorry, hosts and VMs are typically backwards compatible. So if you have a, um, you know, uh, an old virtual machine version like uh, 5.1, Oddly enough, it'll generally work on a newer host, uh, running like a 6.7 or 6.5, but it won't work in the opposite direction. You can't take a 7.0 uh, VM and put it on a 6.5 or 6.7 host. So if you plan on moving this VM anywhere else, you would want to set it to a compatibility level that is the same or less than the hosts you plan on moving it to. So in this case, I'm going to set it to the 7.0 U2 because I'm not... Uh, I'm not moving it anywhere, it's just a test machine. Here I'm going to pick the guest OS, which is just kind of like your Linux, your Mac, your Windows, or your other, which are like your Novells and your ESXi and your other weird operating systems that might not be your traditional uh, Linux or Windows or Mac. So in this case we're going to do Windows and we're going to do uh, Windows Server 2022. And I'm going to check off this box for virtual Windows Virtualized Based Security. This basically turns on EFI, Secure Boot, um, stuff like that. It has to be uh, turned on in both locations though uh, in order to get passed through to the guest OS. Um, but I'm going to turn it on here uh, for this VM particularly. I'm going to hit next. Here I'm going to pick the storage for the VM. In this case there's only one uh, data store on this server or on this, uh, this physical host which is just an internal SSD for testing. Um, if you have a network storage like a, a Synology or um, you know a NAS, it'll show it. You can mount it here and create a store on it. It could be an option here. If you had other internal storage, it would show here. If you had a SAN, it would show in here. If you configured it as a data store, so um, typically you probably see more than one option for storage in here. But on my test server, I only have one on on this particular one. So I'm gonna hit next, and here we're gonna have the settings for the. Uh, the VM, your CPUs, your memory, your hard disk, uh, your network adapter. I'm going to make a separate video going into detail on the different settings that are inside of each of these options. The defaults generally work fine if you pick the right operating system early on. Like I said, with the uh, that cu that customized um, or choosing the, uh, the the guest OS, where you can choose, you know, the Windows and then Windows Server and what version and everything like that. This is sort of what gets pre-configured by that information that you choose early on. So Generally speaking, it'll pick settings that are reasonable for the uh, the, the the OS you're trying to use. Um, one suggestion here is that you expand the CPU option and just confirm the sockets are right. Sometimes people come in here and they just put a, a random number in here. And in this case, it actually 
uh, came out uh, kind of accurate here with the the the, the, um, the number here. But sometimes people come in and they create one and they have you know one core per socket and shows as four sockets and you know especially once you have some more commercial grade hardware and you have a larger number of cores and sockets. I've seen some you know some weird stuff like people creating servers with you know 34 CPU sockets or 32 CPU sockets with one core each and it doesn't make sense. I'm sure it'll run, but it's not recommended. I would definitely consider, um, you know, I, I guess as a preference of mine, it's probably also some to some degree best practice to try and match up the uh, sockets and use realistic numbers and try and match it with the hardware you actually have. Um, you know, same thing. I wouldn't, you know, if you have two CPUs, and you know, I wouldn't necessarily give give it one CPU with a lot of cores. You know, just try and be uh, realistic. I think with these numbers, um, typically, like I said, it, it it tends to, you know, usually mess up the number of sockets. So I just come in here and make sure it looks good. Um, you know, four cores per socket. I only have one socket, so that all works out for me. Um, and then we're going to go into the memory. So, yeah, memory here, 4 gigs is fine for, I mean, uh, uh, just a test VM here. Um, but you can set your memory you have here. Here it has a, a hard disk configured, so um, this is it as 90 gigs. The other thing I would consider changing in here is um, the setting for the disk provisioning. So there's an option for thin provisioned and thick provisioned and another thick provisioned option. Um, the, the real difference here is between thin and thick provisioned in in my experience and the difference is if you thin provision um, if you were to create a let's say a 100 gig disk on here that's thin provisioned and it only uses 20 gigabytes then its footprint is only 20 gigabytes in the file size and everything it's using um, it won't show as a hundred uh, you know on the you know in in size if you thick provision, it reserves that 100 gigs, and it'll show as 100 gigs in that file footprint. And so what I've seen become a problem with thin provisioned is that you have a chance to over provision. For example, if you have 200 gigs of available space in your data store, and then you, you give one virtual machine uh, a thin provisioned 100 gigabyte disk, and you give another VM a 150 gigabyte thin provision disk. Um, there are really no errors in the system. It'll allow you to create those VMs, um, and if you are using those VMs, those operating systems will show you that you have 150 gigs of storage on one and 100 on the other. However, in actuality, you only have 200 gigs total space, and that totals to 150. Uh, 250. So you'll end up with 50 gigs that don't exist um, when you you know when you might be led on to believe that it exists by looking at the the operating system so thick provision kind of prevents you from doing that by reserving the storage ahead of time um, which eats it up immediately uh, which is you know maybe that might I guess take some more time to transfer I guess from one host to another or from one storage to another but it does save you the headache of accidentally over-provisioning your storage and then getting stuck in a jam where you think you have storage and you really don't have any storage. Uh, NVMs are able to um, logically go past their storage that they actually have and they get confused on why they're out of storage also. So a lot of, you know, if Windows, uh, if you have a Windows 11 VM and it gets close to running out of storage, there are some built-in, you know, Windows... Uh, cleaning utilities. I think that they're in Windows 10 also. That will kick in and start cleaning up your um, you know, your temp files and stuff. But if you're if the, if Windows thinks that you have 50 gigs you don't have, and it has 50 gigs free, it's not going to do that because it doesn't think there's it thinks that there's space left, but there's not. So just kind of a small rant on <laughs> the issues of thin provisioning versus thick provisioning, which is probably a um, you know a uh, a well talked about concept or debate uh, is a better word debate a strong debate in the IT community right now I would imagine um, but I was just thick provisioned for just the, avoiding the headache of over provisioning so um, that's fine going to the next section here the rest of the defaults are fine again I'll make another video on the uh, the more you know intricate settings here um, one other thing I'll mention 
<laughs> while I'm at it, is this adapter type. Um, the E1000E is, is kind of an older, I would say an older adapter type, a little bit limited. Um, the VMX Net 3 is a better adapter in my opinion. Uh, but it does usually require a um, you know your VMware tools to be installed, those drivers for that adapter. The E1000E uh, e is sometimes compatible out of the box with certain OSs, so you boot it up, you have networking. But um, I think that that's hence the name E1000E. I think you're capped at a gig there. So if you were going to use 10 gig or just in general, I think the VMX Net 3 is a better adapter. But you do usually need to install... Uh, VMware tells what you should anyway, but you know you may not see an adapter off uh, out of the gate when you boot this thing up. So um, yeah, that was one of the things I would suggest changing. And the video card potentially at some point, if you do have an issue where um, your screen resolution options are missing, you can't make it higher than a certain amount. You may want to specify a, a higher number of video memory in here, uh, which will increase the amount of choices you have for screen resolution options. Um, for now, default's fine. Uh, the last setting in here I'll talk about, which is an important one, is how do you actually get the installer onto this VM, and that is through this CD drive, which right now is on host device, which basically means that um, this is a, just happens to be an HP desktop that I'm testing with right now. And if you go over there and put a disk in the front of the, you know, the front of the desktop, then this that physical host CD drive will be will be sh you know showing up in the VM, which if you are, you know, still installing operating systems from a CD drive or from a CD, there might be different problems that we have to deal with here. <laughs> but uh, I was just switching this over to the data store ISO. Um, I uploaded in a, a Windows Server 2022 installer here onto my data store earlier. So I have an ISO for the installer here. I'm going to select that. And this is going to mount an ISO um, as a CD onto the VM when it boots up. So, and I selected that path here. It's on connected, it's connected at power on. Um, this all looks good. There are, again, more settings under VM options. Not gonna go into those now. They're really, the defaults usually work fine in most cases. Um, and if you need more disks, you can always add them here by just clicking this button. If you need more adapters, you can add them here. If you need to pass through more devices, like a, a USB controller or um, something specific, you can add those here as well. So. I'm going to hit next. This is our configuration for the VM. Um, all the settings that we've just gone through, they're all laid out here. I'm going to go ahead and press finish. And you'll see here the VM was created. So I'm going to just power it on just so you can see um, what it looks like. I'm going to hit the key just so it boots up to that disk. And um, yeah, so we're booting up to our installer, that ISO that was mounted before. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's how you create a VM in ESXi. Uh, I guess as quickly as I could get through it, <laughs> there's some settings that um, I'll talk about in a more of a deep dive video on those uh, specific VMware settings or uh, specific VM settings that are in ESXi. And in another video, I'll cover how to create a, a VM in vCenter. It's a very similar process, um, but I want to cover that UI also. So thank you for watching. I hope this was useful to you, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe. Our website has some resources that you might find useful as well. Confused IT is a non-for-profit organization ran by IT professionals. Our mission is to make IT knowledge more accessible and easier to digest. Thanks for watching.